I just you. remembered recording, just forgot. So yep, recording now. Violetta? I'm also excited just like everybody else. I know you put a lot of work into researching um, self-empathy, so I'm very curious. It's probably the part of empathy I know the least about. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. DJ? Hi. Um, Self-empathy is actually what I know the most about. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Lou, we're doing just doing a quick round of check-in. Yeah, hi, sorry, I was late. Um, yes, I'm looking really looking forward to this too. I, like Kara, I agree that self-empathy is really important. You know, in the, in the teaching of NVC, you usually try to teach about self-empathy first before empathy for another. And I, I've thought, I've wondered whether we should swap that in the sequence of this course. Thanks, Lou. Uh, Jana or Jana, I'm not sure. Yeah, Jana. Jana. Jana, yeah, I'm at work. I'll be coming and going. I'm happy to be here. And to learn more about self-empathy, I looked at some of what you sent. I opened that dissertation, that little piece of it that was there. Yeah, it says that self-empathy not correlated with aspects of empathy. So interesting to learn more. Thank you, Dana. Crystal, by the pool. <laughs> I'm taking a self-empathy me day. <laughs> Thank you. I'm only going to be here for an hour today, but I'm so looking forward to seeing how other people define self-empathy because I think like empathy itself it is self-defined. So I'm very curious to see what your definition is and what you've researched and learned. And I do agree with Lou as well in terms of the sequencing. Yeah. Thank you, Krista. Um, so Edwin, uh, can we start? Yeah, ready to go. It's all yours, you're, you're in charge. So uh, I'm just going to uh, do it the way I would do it in the actual session. And of, of course, we'd love your feedback about what, what worked and what didn't. So before we start the session, I'm sure that all of you have some idea of what self-empathy means to you. And I'd like you to just take a moment to reflect about what it means to you. What does self-empathy really mean to you? And then uh, maybe after a minute or so, we can discuss it in the main group. You can journal if you like, and or you could just take a moment and close your eyes and just really think about what it means to you. Why is it important? Uh, what role has it played in your life? And how can it help us? How can it? Uh, how does it play out in the uh, uh, empathy circle? I see uh, many of you are ready, so um, maybe someone would like to share and we can just do it popcorn style, like uh, whoever wants to share can speak up briefly about what they think self-empathy is and what it means to them. Just, I just invite you to unmute and just speak. Um, I'm happy to start. Um, for me, self-empathy at the moment, um, I would define it as my capacity to attune to, to embody, to be responsive to, and to share my feelings and emotions. It's a bit long-winded, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Oh, 
Go ahead, Jana. To me, self-empathy is, um, is about just accepting whatever it is and just being uh, uh, accepting of uh, imperfection and, and accepting whatever um, arises. And then to be able to be more accepting and of imperfections of others as a result and, and less judgmental of others. Yeah, acceptance. Yes, Edwin. Uh, yeah, for me, self-empathy is sensing into, feeling into my myself, my felt experience or the landscape of, of myself. And it's the process of sensing in. And uh, it, and so the, the way of being of how to do that without judgment, without being critical, kind of with the quality of openness and, and uh, acceptance uh, of what's there. And I see that in the empathy, we're, em we're doing self-empathy all the time. Like it's, you know, a silent self-empathy, just as a human being, we, we have that. Uh, in the empathy circle, the person who's the speaker is sort of the center of attention and all the attention is on them. And I think that that offers support and the space to, for the speaker to uh, sense in deeper uh, to themselves. Yeah. Thank you, Edwin. Go ahead, Kara. So I love I love everything. So so far what I've heard is great. I I guess I think of self-empathy as sort of hearing oneself, you know. Um It's really easy to do internally. I think it's more impactful if you do it externally because uh, when we're inside our own head, it's really easy to spiral into our own um, empathy tunnel. Whereas when we take it external, that self-empathy becomes genuine, becomes impactable and, and you hear yourself in a different way when you're outside of your own head. Hmm. Violetta, I think you wanted to say something. Okay. I'm struggling because the, the way I see empathy is um, connection between two humans doesn't make a lot of sense in this in the in, in the terms of self empathy. So I'm going back to the basics, and I'm thinking um, of Rogers talking about empathy being kind of built on the bricks of. Um, authenticity and unconditional positive regard. Um, and I guess that's where I could make that switch. As I said, I, I know very little about self-empathy to a point where it doesn't fit. I could call it self-knowledge, I could call it um, introspection or even self-compassion, but empathy, the way I see it is more about this union that becomes the intersubjective space between two humans. Um, but if I do provide this authenticity and unconditional positive regard to myself, um, then I am able to um, probably notice my biases. Somehow to my surprise, I connected self-empathy with biases very closely, um, something we kind of talked about last time. So very uncombed thoughts here, but that's, that's where, where I landed. Thank you, El. Go ahead, Christian. Yeah, just building on what Violetta said, for me, self-empathy is best defined even between a mother and a child, as Edwin's photo beautifully demonstrated last week. Um, and I do encourage us to find other photos as well um, to demonstrate the diversity of thought and being that we all are. But in a sense, you know, when a child comes into the world, they have to navigate their surroundings and learn to self-soothe. And it's a process and um, it is at the intersection between two people that we cultivate our own sense of self-empathy in the world and define it from, from that origin. Thank you. And just to add one other thing, this is why I feel so strongly about biases and that real self-empathy is when you are at peace in the face of biases and you choose to be you.
Lou, you're on mute. I see that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I agree with a lot of what has been said. I would say that I um, self-empathy for me is tuning into myself, um, both into my body and my heart, They're kind of the same thing. Um, and my thoughts too, I guess. Um, and, uh, and in response to what Violetta said about it being relational, I think of, I have different parts of myself. So I'm aware internally that I have different parts. So I could think of it relationally that way, you know, that there's the part of the critic and the, the little child inside me. And those are sources of different kinds of feelings and thoughts. Um, and I think that um, tuning into myself and becoming aware of those things, and then in most cases calling on what I would call my nurturing voice, the compassionate voice that gives understanding and acceptance and um, reminds me who I am and that I'm okay, even if I'm not perfect or I'm not functioning okay. And the way in which that um, kind of returns equilibrium to me so that I have more choice in what I'm doing. That's what I think of as self-empathy. Thank you, Lou. Go ahead, DJ. <clears throat> yeah, so I wrote a little bit in the notes about self-empathy. Um, self-empathy to me is knowingness. Um, it is a complete experience. I don't need other people to have self-empathy. I'm complete in my self-empathy. And my self-empathy is why I'm alive today. Because if I did base it on relations, I would be dead. I would have been dead a hundred times over mm. because of the cruelty and the abuse and the trauma that's in our world. You know, we are not embraced, we're not loved. You could go through a whole year of your life and maybe never have a real connection with someone, depending on your job, depending on where you live, depending on how you've constructed your life. I mean, what's that about? So self-empathy for me is absolutely everything. And so I'm totally cool with being that island. They say, no woman is an island. I am. <laughs> so there you go. Blows all the research up the doors, doesn't it? But, you know, that's the whole thing. Being an outlier is my role mm. in life. So there you go. Thank you, DJ. So a lot of interesting viewpoints and a lot of it, uh, I mean, the research that I did with participants echoed a lot of the stuff that you guys mentioned. So uh, let's just uh, dig into my presentation. Um, so is my screen visible to everybody? It. Yeah. Okay. I'm not making it full screen so that I can see you guys. Okay. So uh, this is um, uh, Kyle Rogers uh, speaks about a way of being, uh, and he speaks about uh, an empathic way of being. He mentions it as being with others, but I just turned that on its head and I uh, made it as being with oneself. So I'd love for you to put in the chat when I say empathic way of being with oneself. What does that mean for you? Just one line. What does that mean for you? An empathic way of being with yourself. So Lou says, feeling and listening into myself, being aware, kindness, being kind to myself, a quality of character and attitude, Being with self with no expectations, yes. Being authentic and loving with myself, yes. So 
these are some definitions that I got from the uh, from other experts uh, in the field of self empathy. So here's one from Jordan. He says, self empathy means that there's an aspect of yourself that observes another aspect of yourself. So uh, this was also Violet, Violetta talking about this confusion about, uh, you know, because she saw empathy only in terms of interrelational, but uh, there's an aspect of yourself that's observing another as aspect of yourself in an empathic manner. And that's the aspect of yourself that you experience. And what is the attitude that you have there? The attitude is one of suspended judgment and openness towards, towards the experience. And there's another, uh, another definition that I found really interesting and uh, appropriate for the circle was that self-empathy is very simple. It just requires you to notice, first notice, right? That's the first step. And then recognize what is happening where inside you, right? Usually we are always taught to be very externally focused, be very focused on others and things. But like, this is very unnatural for someone to say oh just notice and recognize actually what's happening inside so we are going against the tide by noticing what's happening inside and this is just a diagram i made from all the research that we, we conducted two empathy circles with participants who've participated in many circles before and we just recorded their thoughts on self-empathy and we had two questions for them uh, what does self-empathy mean to you and how do you apply the self-empathy in the circle and then I picked some, uh, there were many common or um, uh, some kind of like indicators that were common. And so I grouped them and I categorized them. And these were the categories that I thought. So uh, many people said self-empathy was simply receiving the experience, whatever the experience was that was happening around them. It was uh, many people did mention a non-judgmental awareness of self. Sensing and feeling into the self and the full experience and the various variations of that. Uh, main, uh, and another one was maintaining how uh, self empathy is also like when somebody's speaking, like for example, when an active speaker is speaking and I'm triggered by something that they say, that I have this awareness of what's happening inside me, but at the same time, I'm also able to focus and give my attention to the listener at the same time. So this is an advanced skill of self empathy where you're able to maintain your awareness in both places, inside as well as outside. Many people mention connection with self. So what, what, is the, uh, what happens is, what are, the, what are the results of all these things? When you're able to simply receive, when you're able to just be aware non-judgmentally to what's happening inside you, the consequences are that you have a connection with yourself. Many people report this as having, I'm more connected with myself. And what happens when you're more connected with yourself is that you experience this sense of groundedness, uh, this sense of peace and calm, and that you're able to react, uh, you're able to respond to situations and not react. So you're able to come from a place of wisdom and clarity and uh, uh, calmness rather than uh, any like arou uh, aroused emotions. And an, uh, one thing that comes in the way of self-empathy is the blocks to self-empathy. And many people reported this as being non-ungrounded or having some kind of noise in their head or uh, not being having overwhelming emotions to some trigger, some past hurt trauma that they were not able to work through and that got triggered in the circle and many other things. We are going to more, uh, go into more detail as the... Uh, as I progress in the presentation, are there any doubts or something you think should be uh, should be added here? Uh, would an, uh, would anybody like to say something, or can I move on? Lou, you wanted to say something? Yes, Crystal. Yeah, I just wanted to say that as I've been sharing with Lou, we're working on this issue, the blocks. I see them as bridges, because when you are at the place of awareness, when you're present. You can then transcend your own blocks when you're aware of them and create bridges with others. And it's that next step, I think, for empathy with others. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you, Krista. Uh, could you just clarify for me what you mean, uh, um, maintaining awareness inside self and outside self? What, what do we mean by inside self and outside self? So uh, what I mean by that is, for example, when someone is speaking, like let's say an active speaker is uh, speaking and they say something that triggers me, right? Mm. And there is something going on inside me. There's always something going on in my flow of experience because 
there is an external uh, stimulus coming in. Uh, uh, those who are really advanced in empathy, they, they are able to maintain the awareness of what's happening inside them. Like, oh, I'm feeling uh, sad right now. I'm feeling calm. And, but at the same time, that, does, that awareness of self does not distract them from giving their full attention also to the person that is speaking, of being aware of what is happening in their world. So it's like uh, maintaining awareness of both. For me, I, 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 I and yes, I, I take your definition. I'm just wondering about this calling it an inside self and an outside self. That you know, it implies. Um, well, th there's lots I could say, but for me, those two terms. I'm just wondering if there's, um, you know, our inner, you know, inner awareness and external. Um, awareness rather than the idea of in and out of self so, yeah. yeah yeah we can change that thank you wendy i just wanted to add one aspect that lou brought up is so that inner dialogue between parts of the self uh like i can have different feelings in myself and they can actually empathically dialogue with, with each other and i think that lou is sort of uh mentioning that and it seems like that's uh, a uh, important aspect so yeah yeah so it's like the family systems dynamic internal families systems that we have and that they and how do our inner selves different parts sort of dialogue and actually empathically dialogue with each other yeah and and i would i would say for me that what edwin just described is embodied or contained inside your maintaining awareness of self and outside self so that it's it's a like a breakout detail that the part of maintaining awareness of inside might be having that little dialogue oh man i'm triggered man i'm upset i got a lot of energy in my chest and but breathe remember to breathe just stay calm and what is it i'm supposed to be doing now right i'm listening to the other person so what are they saying you know that that is the dialogue that goes on inside me that allows me to do what you've described in that box which is awareness of self and then but also staying present to um what's going on externally yeah and uh actually uh i remember speaking to edwin about this people who are really advanced like in empathy practitioners they can actually uh, feel uh, uh, just by purely focusing on the other person they can achieve their groundedness like I'm not at that level yet. So when I'm triggered, I have to go away by, I have to take a pause from the conversation, I have to go away and I have to uh, like ground myself. But uh, people who are really advanced, they can actually put focus their attention so much on the other person and what they're saying. It's kind of like a meditative practice where they achieve groundedness by uh, fo uh, you know, focusing their attention on the other person. So that that is just something I, I think is amazing. Uh, and... I remember, Edwin, do you remember we spoke about this? And that can happen in the circle as well. Yeah, the being empathic with others can be a grounding experience. It's like a trust and empathy that if if I can hear the other person, if I can really see, hear what their feelings and needs and their whole experience, their desires are, that sort of okay. search, uh, that that awareness is, for me is can be grounding in a anxiety producing environment yeah okay so i'm going to move on i i wanted to just say yeah, something go ahead that we're not coming from the terminology isn't coming from the contemplative uh tradition and so just to translate you know like wendy asked about sensing into and also here, like having multiple selves or multiple aspects of self and a continuity of consciousness um view i think that the aspects of self would be the subsequent mind moment reflecting on a previous mind moment you know so a subsequent mind moment might be one of contentment and a previous mind moment might be one of anger or agitation yeah. and so like that rather than a, you know so the the we're continually changing and and you know how many selves are we going to uh, create or invent or, or cling to so sensing into also i would offer mindfulness and the terms usually used these days are mindful awareness or just awareness like like wendy suggested so yeah so yeah and, and so i'll just offer that thank you jenna 
Uh, we, I'll come to that in a moment when, when I speak about focusing. Uh, and I deliberately wanted to stay away from uh, like spiritual terminology because I don't know, in at least in my country, like we have so many religions. And if the moment I start speaking about one religion or one tradition, people get turned off. So I wanted to deliberately use terminology that is neutral, but uh, focusing is very similar to uh, the, like the Buddhism uh, concepts that you just raised. So, um, yeah, so now we come to the question of what is self, which is what we've been discussing. So everyone has a self, right? And uh, uh, this is something I've taken from the IFS from Richard Schwartz. So he says, everyone has a self. And when we speak about the self in capital letters, this is the competent, secure, self-assured, relaxed uh, self that is able to listen to and respond to feedback. And uh, when we are triggered or when we are aroused or when we're going through very overwhelming emotions, there are different parts in ourselves. Uh, there are different parts that are part of this whole family system. And these parts then uh, want to act up or they want to, uh, I mean, they always come from a space of trying to be good, good to us and to protect us when we really listen to them. So self-empathy really means uh, trying to, and when we say groundedness, what we mean is that we remove the self, we uh, detach the self from these different parts. Uh, sometimes these parts start acting so much that we, we don't have access to the self. So through the process of self-empathy, we detach the self. And then once we do that, we are able to act in a manner that is competent, secure, self-assured, etc. So uh, NVC, like Lou also said, NVC in the nonviolent communication uh, model, Marshall Rosenberg also spoke uh, about uh, self-empathy. So according to the NVC model, the self-empathy means understanding feelings and needs. So uh, that, uh, and then um, uh, uncomfortable feelings point to unmet needs, comfortable feelings point to met needs. And so the self-empathy in NVC is the process of moving from the aware. So what you do is you start with awareness of sensations in your body because the sensations are what point to your feelings. And then the feelings point to what needs are being met or unmet in that moment of life, whatever moment you're going through in that life. And the idea is to stain the needs consciousness because once you're in the needs consciousness, you're away from blame, you're away from judgment uh, and uh, away from criticizing yourself, criticizing others, et cetera. And that's, that's where, where, where you, you can act from that higher self, which is compassionate and self-assured. And uh, Gendlin also spoke about this. And um, uh, so he says that uh, in the process of focusing, which I thought is what exactly we do in when we, when we kind of talk about self-empathy in the circle, at least, is that he says you take the attitude that you're glad your body spoke to you. Like whatever it said, it doesn't matter what your body is saying. You take this attitude. It's an attitude. Self-empathy is really an attitude of you're really glad that whatever your body is telling you, it could be like the worst thing, but you're glad that it's telling you that you don't have to believe it, right? <laughs> This is the fun. This is the best news. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to agree with it. You or you don't have to say if your felt self is saying go break that uh, go break that remote right now. You don't have to do it. All you have to do is receive it. And that is a skill we need to learn because our whole lives, I, at least me, I can speak for myself. That my whole life, I thought my thoughts are real. So if my thoughts would say you are a horrible person, I felt like I was obliged to believe them because I'm thinking them, right? But it's really good news to know that I don't have to believe all the crap that comes out of my head. You, I only the only my only job is to receive it, and you reassure your felt sense that you'll be back again. So for example, it gets overwhelming and it's like too much to handle. You can always reassure your felt sense that, hey, I'll be back when I have more resources to, uh, to take you in and I can continue the process at a later point. So it's not like I have to do everything right now and resolve all my life's traumas right now. So because the moment you set specific goals, we, are a, we, we live in a culture that is very goals driven. We have to achieve things and we, we are taught that right since kindergarten. So we never really thought just sit there and receive whatever is coming right everything we do has some goal so it takes a lot of con uh, undoing of those condition that conditioning goal oriented conditioning to actually you know do what Gendlin is saying is that it's not work right focusing is not work it it's like it's a it's if you think about self-empathy is what I think about is it's just a friendly time with your body where you receive whatever your body is telling you you do it with an attitude where you don't have to believe 
anything that your body's saying, just have to receive it. So uh, I put this, uh, the process of self-empathy into a circle. I mean, sorry, I put this into a diagram as how I see uh, self-empathy showing up in, uh, in the empathy circle. So the speaker, what happens with the speakers? When the speaker is speaking, there is self-exploration and discovery because they are sensing into themselves and whatever's coming up, they are sharing it. So they are also sensing into the felt sense of what is happening in their body. And uh, there's all the silent listeners and the active listeners are giving the speaker attention as well as the active listener gives a reflection. Now, when the active listener is also sensing into uh, their body, they have awareness of what's happening. Hopefully, when they are very advanced, they have awareness of what's happening inside themselves, but also what's happening outside. And they reflect back to the speaker. Now, when the speaker uh, hears that, that reflection of what they said, it is also a kind of self-empathy because they're hearing what they just said. It's like a repetition because, and so when they're hearing what they just said coming from another person, it gives them, uh, it's like a process of self-empathy again. And uh, everybody has to maintain that awareness and that sensing. <coughs> and so this, this, these roles keep shifting throughout the circle. <coughs> And according to uh, some research, what are the benefits of self-empathy? I think we need to share this with the audience because uh, when we're defining something, we also have to share what the benefits are. Like, hey, if you, if you, uh, if self, and this is what the way we are describing what self-empathy is. And if you do this, this, these are the benefits that you're going to get. The first one is that it dissolves alienation of the parts. So all of us have traumatized parts. So let's say uh, you're really afraid of public speaking because when you were in school, you gave a speech and everybody laughed at you. And so you, you've had this part, this small girl, this full of shame that you kind of repress because it's too painful to feel it. And so that part has always felt alienated and it can impact your life in different ways. For example, every time you want to give a speech, that part starts acting up because it doesn't want to, you to feel that shame. So uh, what happens through self-empathy is that you can work through, you can give empathy to that part and dissolve the alienation that that part feels in your system. It also makes all, the, all your parts feel valued, cared for, uh, and understanding all these different parts that you've banished, even the critical part, the shameful part, all of these, when they are integrated into, by, uh, through understanding and empathy from that non-judgmental attitude, it gives rise to a new self-concept. So for example, before working on that part, you are this person, oh, my self-concept is that I don't give speeches. But after that, you could have a new self-concept which says, I can give speeches. I love giving speeches because you work through those shameful parts. And again, it also, I think it uh, having self-empathy uh, helps you to uh, experience life more fully because it allows for expansion and the flow of life experience. If you go through life because you have all these scared parts, all these banished parts that you're so afraid that to look inside and you're so afraid to work through, you might go to you, people. That's why people get addicted to things. That's why people go into addiction or they become workaholics or they become alcoholics. But when we allow this flow of experience thing and accept just whatever it is, we can experience life more fully. And we can also, what the, the final result is that th there's congruence in all your parts. You develop a deep caring and understanding attitude towards yourself. So this is a definition <laughs> that I came up with all these uh, from Richard Schwartz. I translated some of Carl Rogers' empathy towards others. I just changed it to myself. And then also from Gendlin. And so I just want you to read through this and just let me know. I know it's really big, but um, I wanted to include all the aspects. And I would love to hear comments or 
feedback on anything that you would like to share and anything that's come up, coming up for you. So for me, uh, it's lovely. What, what's there is really lovely and fits, you know, uh, and, and the other thing that comes up for me is thinking about how will this be used, let's say in the course or in um, what kind of impact would it have on people who are learning to facilitate empathy circles <clears throat> or participate to to read all of this and think, I mean, so I have a fear that they would read all of this and say, oh, this is not for me. It's much too complicated. It's very hard to do. Like, I don't, I, you have to be like a trained therapist to do this. So I don't, I don't think this is for me. Yeah. I, I think we need to, I need to work on simplifying it. Well, and, and the question of, you know, what pieces of this would we will wind up in the final course. I think it's great yeah. to like explore and expand. And then I just think there's a layer of needing to ask the question, yeah. what pieces of this do we use, you know? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yes, Kara. Yes. Of this sounds a lot like the Toltec wisdom, like that whole the idea of removing the smoke from the mirror so you can see yourself and others more clearly. So I wonder, because I know that there's a lot of micro notes, I wonder if some of that language would help make this more accessible and more concise. Yeah. Something that's coming up for me, Priyanka, is, yeah, I love this whole exploration. It just lead, leads to a lot of uh, uh, different uh, threads, ideas uh, coming up. What was coming up for me was uh, the um, way of being aspect, that there's, there's something about self-empathy, when we're self-empathy, that there's a, a way of being where we do that self-empathy versus different ways of being, which are maybe judgmental, you know, or fearful, or do we have sort of this character and that the, the self-empathy is a way of being versus a way of being, like I was saying, like, oh, a very timid, afraid uh, sort of a way of being. And, and there's just a lot of different ways of being and just thinking in terms of, of that way of being that, that was just coming up for me. Yeah, so probably it should start with self-empathy is a way of being. <laughs> that, da, 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 da. I think it's uh, being concise is, requires a lot of effort and skill. But as we are iterating, I wanted to include all of this because I, I, it felt like everything is important. But yes, I agree with Lou that it can overwhelm someone who's who's very new to it and who's just trying to facilitate empathy circles. So we uh, need to figure out a way of making it more accessible, definitely. But I just wanted to include all of this. Yes, DJ? Yes, um, I think this self-empathy definition is okay. Um, I think you could qualify it and just say self-empathy de definition or self-empathy could be you know, listening attentively. It could be yeah. for some people, for most people, or sometimes, you know, I mean, you just have to qualify it because not everybody's going to subscribe to all of this. Yeah. And and you might just sure. want to keep this somewhere where people could look it up before an empathy circle and read about it if they so are, you know, they're compelled to do that. But, you know, most people, if you ask them, you know, what is self-empathy to you, they'll probably come up with some kind of answer, usually you know, that they already have a living definition, usually, but not always, right? So it's just qualifying everything, usually, sometimes, most often, maybe consider this, you know, I mean, I think it's fine what you did. I think you did a lot of good work. I like the idea of keeping it neutral. I think that's really important to keep it neutral. So good job, really good job. Thank you, DJ. Yeah, I think that's important. Thank you for bringing that uh, because it sounds like this is the truth, but it's not, right? It's not everyone has to accept it. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, okay. Um, Priyanka, yes. can I add something uh, to the conversation? Yeah. It, Please it go ahead. I can't see everybody. So if you want to say, just go ahead because okay. I can't see everybody on my screen. Yeah. Um, it brings me back to the conversation we had 
um, about the first session um, and the idea that we are inviting people into a Rogerian uh, framework um, and how complicated it is to mix different uh, theoretical frameworks, um, thinking uh, philosophically, epistemologically, um, I'm, I'm having trouble with uh, a definition that, that is combining many different uh, theories, mostly because of language, uh, because of the, the, the words mean different things in the different paradigms. I personally do not, I've yet to find a value in the IFS, so I'm, I'm, that's not how I think. Um, obviously, ev every one of us is pre preparing their portion. So if IFS is where it sounds like you're lending the self-empathy definition, then maybe maybe use that. Um, I think it's very confusing internal family systems. As a Jana, it's it's becoming very uh, we're very um, varied, which is wonderful. Uh, but I would say it's valuable to be brave with whatever um, your framework truly is. It's inevitable to bring our assumptions to the table. I, uh, I can try to co-construe uh, meaning with Priyanka, but I'm having my own assumptions and Priyanka is having her own assumptions. So yeah. in order to co-construe accurately, I need to explore those and bring them to the table clearly. Um, so I'm, th that's probably, I totally agree with Lou, we have to, there's too much on this slide. And I think it's so much that is very confusing, even for me. Um, and um, it, it confusing just because words are described and defined differently in the different frameworks. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very much um, supportive of the idea of choosing um, a theoretical framework that's consistent as much as possible. Um, we are in the way of being model, which is Rogerian. So if we could stay maybe with the NVC model, I think that will be the cleanest um, theoretical background, but th that will be, those are my, my thoughts. Yeah, if I could just build on that, um, and I know that I come from this perspective with the beginner's mindset, um, so let me just say that. For me, I, I still go back to that it's, I had originally had be present as my five steps um, for empathy. Um, and after speaking with Dwayne, we changed that to be aware. But that way of being that Edwin describes, um, what, to be a way of being aware, I often correlate with being linked in or linked out. And I think that that awareness of when I am in my own mind feeling linked in or linked out, and also my empathy with others when I see it happening for them is a bridge. And to that end, I think, Priyanka, what you've done here is a beautiful analysis of what it can mean for so many people that I think would be great to use in storytelling. And for example, if I could just indulge for one moment, the story of the Wizard of Oz with Dorothy, she had great empathy and she was able to sense in to the needs of the Tin Man and the Lion and even the witch, the Wicked Witch. And so that capacity of what you're sharing here could be demonstrated even in a story like the Wizard of Oz, as Edwin does with a photo to demonstrate that it is an individual journey, but it's recognizing when people are linked in and linked out and what empathy means for them um, in their journey. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Um, yeah, I, I reiterate um, what everyone said and just circling back to what Lou was saying, it, it, for me, that slide is trying to cover such a lot and the challenge with that in the end, it could end up covering nothing because, you know, there would be a, a, a perhaps for many people a, a, a challenge to just read. So, I mean, for me, just the first sentence would be enough. And then the other things could be alluded to in the way DJ um, suggested yeah. relatively. 
And also I have a complete thing about the use of the word one. <laughs> you know, for me, I just, I can't, uh, yeah. It, it, it's what? like, try, it, it, it's trying to be academic it, to my mind. Whenever it, I just don't see what's wrong with my or your, you know, self empathy is listening to one set. It, yeah, for me, it, I have challenges with the word one. one. Okay. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, DJ. I can't okay. see you, so just start speaking. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I'll try to be quick. Um, I think there's a really broad issue here that we haven't talked about, and that's the ethnocentrism of all of this discussion. It's just unbelievable how ethnocentric it is. And I understand there's a neutrality to it and an attempt to be neutral. Um, and I think that you're, you know, in that direction, Kiyanka, what you're, what you're, where you're going. I think you're really trying to take away the ethnocentrism of the empathy circle and these whole notions about empathy and self-empathy and representations and symbolisms and all of these different kinds of representation of empathy and self-empathy, how ethnocentric it is. I mean, how white and Western so much of this is. And so I, I do think it's important to open it up to indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous ways of knowing, according to scholars in the field, um, start from the center. So there's always a center. And that's where the research begins. That's where the definitions begin is at the center. And, and so instead of being external and say, well, so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that, and this is this field and this is this model and this, you know, really, if you threw it all out, if you threw absolutely everything out that we've ever read, never thought about, and use the indigenous ways of knowing of how to reveal the research that lives in all of us right here, we would actually dissolve those ethnocentric boundaries that create bias and judgment. So if we wanna bring people into the empathy circle movement, we have to have these open doors of concepts and I think you're, you're getting there, um, but there, I mean, what would indigenous ways of knowing say about this whole thing, you know? And there are books written about it. You know, I don't know. That's just my two cents. Thank you, DJ. I don't know very much about indigenous cultures, uh, but I, I think we could invite people who do know to add to this. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I'll just say I appreciate the, the starting point here. And I think that's what we need is some place to start uh, to uh, have some material for the dialogue and you know, maybe using the empathy circle to explore deeper and kind of work out all these different uh, topics. So very appreciative of all of this. Thank you, Edwin. So, <clears throat> The problem, I think that uh, I wanted to explore this uh, as a blocks to self-empathy and I wanted to call it like, I just related it to my own experience. Uh, before I started studying NBC and meditating and all of that, I really hated to be with myself because I was so scared of what's inside. Um, I think this is true for many people who've, who start on, the, before they start on their healing journey. Uh, because we've constantly been told by society and I, I, it doesn't matter which culture you're from, you're always told you're not enough. And that's a way of disciplining uh, children also is that <clears throat> you're such a bad child, you didn't do what I wanted you to do, so you're a bad child. And society is built in a way to make us feel not enough. Uh, look at marketing. <clears throat> marketing works by building on that sense that you're not enough. So, hey, let you you buy this cologne or whatever, you buy this car and then you know, and then you'll have friends or whatever. So we are afraid of looking inside because somewhere, <clears throat> at least this is true from my experience that maybe if I look inside, it will be true. Whatever the hor hor horrible things I think about myself, if I look inside, maybe they'll be true. So, but this comes from uh, like all the major religions, uh, philosophical systems, uh, IFS, they all testify to this is, I'm going a little philosophical here and you know, we can discuss about whether it should be there, but I thought it should be there, is that what we are is pure love. Dalai Lama says our true nature is kindness. 
our pure, our true nature's kindness. And the, this is testified by all the religions. All the religions have some form of this thing where, you're, where they say your true self is pure love. And so <clears throat> what, the way to, uh, the way to uh, access that is by simply watching all these, uh, what, what are called in, uh, in Buddhism, because I'm a Buddhist, uh, and we can include other things also. Uh, these are called afflictive, uh, they're called known as affliction, uh, like fear, anger, uh, jealousy, greed, all these things, these things that block our access to the, the to a higher self, which is what Richard, I think Richard Schwartz calls as this grounded self that is able to give and receive feedback. And the, simply by watching them, they become less powerful. It's like the demons that you just watch them. And this is what you do in self-empathy is that simply by watching, they disappear. And I never knew this. That is so simple. Like it's really simple, but it's really hard to do, right? Especially, I know, I remember being able to watch my shame was so hard for me. Mm. Shame is so painful. and But it's true, at least in my experience. So I think this is why people are afraid to look inside. And uh, that's why self-empathy is so hard sometimes. So, mm. I mean, this could be included in the blocks in some way. I didn't know how to put it in a way that is maybe includes everybody because I come from a Buddhist uh, spiritual tradition. So. Mm. Yeah, would love to hear your feedback or thoughts on this. So I, I agree with what you're saying and it fits my life experience too. And it fits my experience of working, coaching hundreds of people and uh, doing leadership training with them. I also think it's an advanced, um, telling people about it and getting them to understand it and use it in a constructive way is is an advanced topic it's not for yeah. beginners yeah and it's it's actually what you're describing is the reason that i started the empathy empathy facilitator support group that i run because there is much more there are many layers of depth to understand about What's my internal capacity? What goes on inside me when I'm a facilitator and somebody says something that's really triggering or somebody starts to question the process or question me, attack me as a facilitator? You know, how, how do I respond to that? What goes on inside me? And how do I increase my capacity to respond to those situations and to stay present? And um, yeah, so I agree completely with what you're saying. And and it's um, and it's an advanced. I would say it's advanced level uh, learning for facilitators. Thank you, Lou. Just again, another small point. It's I, I think it's quite helpful to phrase things that are not. Uh, are less pejorative um so you know people are afraid of what's inside i think it's useful to say many people or some people many most or some and and not to generalize um about anything so yeah yeah i'm gonna say something and i i understand that what i say is really unpopular because no one seems to be able to to say something similar to what I'm saying, but I, I, I don't have this. I've never had it. I've never hated what's inside of me ever, not even for a second. Um, the way that I look at group interaction is you approach it with unconditional love for everyone that's there. That's exactly what you get. And this happened to me when I was teaching large auditoriums full of people. I was coming from South Central Los Angeles where I was teaching some of the poorest children in America who were traumatized by what was really a war going on in their homes. And I went to a place where it was just spoiled white people who thought they could teach spoiled white people. And that was gonna fix something like in their own life. It was like get them a house and a car and summers off and a pension. And basically, you know, forget the world, right? And I was angry. I was angry, like, why don't you see the poverty? 
why aren't you going out there and and doing something about the madness in this world? Why are you so selfish? And that really, that's what I was thinking and judging. And I went through a transformation over the summer and I studied Paulo Freire's love philosophy. I studied all the love philosophy that's out there from Buddhism to Nell Noddings to, to everyone that had love as their philosophy. And I went back that semester, my second year, and it was pure love and it transformed almost all of my students and me. And I continued that for four years and then it would just, I moved on. So love matters. And so when you say, however you are pure love, yourself, your core authentic self is pure love. I agree with that. But apparently this is not something that everyone experiences. So I do think it's important to qualify it, but I totally resonate with that line. So thank you for your time. I would add on to that to say that um, while I agree quickly with what DJ said, um, I have unconditional love for others. I didn't learn that unconditional love for myself initially. And so if you could go back to the slide for a minute, I just wanted to make one point. Um, no, one more. Yeah, I think that when we look at it in terms of what people are afraid of, they're afraid to connect with others who judge them. It's that judgment. And so I don't think it's that we hate what's inside. It's that we are afraid to connect and experience judgment from others. And so I love the last two points that you are pure love and a hundred percent if we watch the feelings that are coming up inside of us as others are speaking, our capacity to have empathy for ourselves and others increases because we start to see it rising in them when we can own it ourselves. And then we see the child in them and then we don't accept the judgment anymore. We accept that they're still stuck in their narrative that you've beautifully described here. But I think at its core, it's really a fear of connecting with others and being judged. So <clears throat> uh, here are the blocks and of course we can build them because I'm sure that I've missed many, but uh, blocks specifically to empathy, self-empathy in the circle, inability to focus. Uh, I've, I've heard this from many participants for the first time who are like, oh my God, I can't focus. Every time I try to focus on the person, they can't focus on them, even on the other person, even and even on themselves. So because their mind keeps uh, playing the stories. So, <clears throat> and then deeply entrenched habits, which we've developed since childhood of approaching life through judgment and through criticism and uh, et cetera. Uh, inability to handle overwhelming emotions that can happen. Uh, lack of knowledge on how to focus on visceral experience as well, because we've never been taught that. I, I never knew how to do that un until I started learning how to meditate. Uh, it, loud internal chatter, like maybe you have like some big deadline at work. So when you're in the circle, it kind of just uh, uh, also external noise. Maybe there are something distracting around you uh, in terms of the environment, uh, conflict, like internal conflict, also external conflict, lack of practice of, uh, for example, if you're a first time empathy circle participant, expecting that you will be able to maintain that attention inside and outside, it's, it's like uh, just too much of an expectation. And also loneliness and alienation, like what Crystal was saying, if I'm, you know, if I've been lonely and alienated for much of my life and then I'm in this circle and I'm afraid of being judged, that could also be a block to self empathy. Uh, <clears throat> and I think it's really important, this project that we are doing for the definition of self-empathy, because when we really learn what self-empathy is, it can help us to overcome these blocks because they help us to check our misconceptions and assumptions about what self-empathy is. And then I've developed some exercises in the, which are coming up next that um, I will, we can do, or I don't know if we have enough time, but we can do, or I can just take you through the plan of what I'm uh, trying to do and also letting participants know at the beginning 
that it's a skill that can that is uh, that that it can take many sometimes many lifetimes to master like you know it's not just something you show up in two circles and expect that i know i had that expectation of myself and i felt very <laughs> bad afterwards that oh my god i'm so bad at empathy and i know that some people can have that so try you know reassuring them in the beginning that it's a skill and i've developed a more, uh, i've developed a, like a grade like a, like a process where uh, different levels of empathy that you can achieve if you practice and also letting people know that it's just like edwin always says it's a muscle like even for empathy for the self empathy is also a muscle and it it can take a lot of time and some people may take more time than others depending on you know their own history personal history so <clears throat> this is uh, a levels i've developed to let people know that uh, this was something inspired by jim and jory mansky who have the same uh, thing for the nbc consciousness so i thought i think people should know uh, like the self empathy where they are on the progress and like if you are at level 6 i think uh, lord buddha or any of those enlightened being jesus would be on level 6 we are all pilgrims on the path so sometimes if we are going through difficult life situations we can go up and down the levels and so that's totally okay that's also totally okay wherever you are is just is just for you to uh, you know and we can work on developing this uh, edwin what is it called in the research uh, i think it's a grade uh, scale it's a scale or something right you yeah they have different measurements um they yeah, have, yeah just measurements uh... yeah measurements so uh, this could be a separate project if anybody is interested on developing this how we measure self empathy so that we can let people know that it's uh, hey you know there's a path for you uh when you first start out this is probably where you will be but this is a path and it uh, you know and uh, you can develop your skills and you can you can move forward <clears throat> and so uh what i was planning was when we are doing the actual uh, uh teaching of self, in the self empathy session we could start by uh, helping people to teach people how to learn focus how to uh, you know concentrate learn concentration and focus because that's really important for building self empathy or empathy for others as well so it's a body scan tech uh, meditation technique where uh, you close your eyes or you leave your eyes open whatever is comfortable for you and you make sure that you're sitting straight and i invite you to do it with me if you want if you don't want that's also okay so uh, make sure that you're sitting straight your back is straight because it helps you to be more aware uh make sure your back is like a guitar string not too tight but also not too thin that you're slouching and uh keep your arms comfortable and just start by focusing on your breath just notice how your breath comes in and your exhale when you're exhaling just follow the breath follow the breath through the entire process of inhalation and exhalation you might have thoughts that distract you away from the breath and that's okay that's the nature of the mind just gently bring it back every time you notice that it's distracted away from the breath now i invite you to bring your attention to the top of your scalp the midpoint of your scalp notice any sensations maybe there's a warmth or a itching or a dull pain or maybe you can feel the cold or the heat of your environment just really notice the sensation your job is simply to witness Now I invite you to move your attention from your scalp to the rest of your head. And move 
uh, as, as like a body scanner. Move your awareness from your forehead gently right down to the tip of your tippy toes. Noticing in every body part what's happening, what sensation is alive. Now I invite you to gently open your eyes and come back to the screen. Just look around you. Would someone like to share how the meditation was for them? Do I need to change something? Do I need to make it longer, shorter? I find it relaxing. I just get really relaxed and uh, yeah, feels good. I would uh, remove the Vipassana aspect of it. Just say body scan because it's pretty generic just to take out yeah. any allusion to religion. Yeah. So I'm not sure mm -hmm. if Vipassana is a religion or what, but. Yeah, it is. It's from the okay. Buddhist tradition. I'll make mm -hmm. sure to remove it. Yeah. I like the way that you invited, you know, you um to constantly use I invite you to do it I think that gives a good sense of openness and uh, yeah yes thank you a cool awareness when you invited everybody back to the screen every single head came back down <laughs> everybody was meditating like this and then we we're like oh yeah back to reality <laughs> <laughs> We've been studying this in Masters of Scale flow state. I would just add that um, athletes, when they take a, take a breath, um, what they do is they take a breath and then they, before they exhale, they take another breath to fully fill the lungs. And you don't do that when you just take a breath. So I would encourage you're looking into that and it's where you go and then you do it again and that, it, that full exhale um, then comes from that process for flow state. Okay. Hey. Um, so, um, yes. Oh, I was just going to say, so I really enjoyed what you did. Um, it, um, your, your pace was excellent and your voice is very like, deli you know, calming and delicious. Um, I would say that it was kind of a big jump from the head all the way down to the toes. So you might just do just a little bit more of a progression, bring the okay. torso and then maybe hip area and then legs and toes as opposed to just like jumping weight. Yeah. So guide them through the... Just okay. a little. You don't have to say a lot. I mean, obviously you went very slowly in the head and then the idea is to do that with the rest of your body. But um, yeah, so yeah. I, that's, I would just say that. Okay. Thanks, Lou. Okay, so uh, the next one is uh, I wanted to help people to practice building their listening to themselves because many of us don't get that practice. So the, I thought maybe we could do a journaling, but if you guys have any other idea, you can uh, yeah, throw it forward to help us to help people to practice their listening to themselves skill. So uh, this is a journaling exercise. So what I would do is I would start a timer for five minutes and I would tell them, think about uh, any incident in your life that you want to write down about, right? So I'm going to start the timer in five minutes and I want you to do free writing. Don't think about the structure, the grammar, write in any language that you want to write. Uh, forget about non-judgmental, anything. Whatever is in your head, just put it down on the paper. You have five minutes. Any incident in your life that you want to discuss or write about.
So you want us to do this now, or are you just saying you're describing the exercise? Uh, if you guys want to do it, I'm open to it. If you don't want to, that's also okay. What would you guys like to do? Well, do we have time? I mean, so we have, there are 45 minutes left in the session, and I don't know how much else you have to say. Uh, I don't have uh, much, so I think we can do five minutes of this and then five minutes discussion. Okay. Um, what are you planning to do with it? Do we have to share it? Uh, I just want to see if this exercise would be work and get your feedback. Like with the meditation, Lou gave me the feedback that if I could do more of, you know, I know, but in reality, if you were doing this in an empathy circle, are you asking people to share what they're writing? Only if they want to. Uh, I'm more interested in the process of how they're listening to themselves rather than what they are writing. So the next step would, uh, I would uh, like, well, after you have, you've written down, I want you to go through that and find any judgments or uh, thoughts that are filled with judgments or criticisms and notice notice those and then once you've done that to share how that changed your experience of how you listen to yourself
okay the time's up so i invite you to stop writing and um, read through what you've written and as you're reading notice if anything comes up in you as you're reading that notice what's going on in your body what thoughts come up as you're reading what you've written notice if there is any judgment or criticism of yourself or your writing or the incident or how you behaved in that incident or whatever comes up for you and notice is it easy for you to listen to whatever is coming up and i would love for you to share your experience of how easy or tough it is for you to read what you what you've written down In fact, because there wasn't really a thing to write about, I, the whole first part is like, my mind is coming up blank. There are lots of stories in my life. What do I write about now? Um, and then I got whenever I, so what I learned in this, in this uh, process is that when I don't know, I get like this bravado thing. And I was like, you know what irritates me is when people try to manage me. <laughs> and then I went into, you know what I would love in my so that was kind of a fun way to watch my help my whole self process through that. I don't know what I'm doing. Well, yeah, I do. And you don't do that. <laughs> Thank you, Kara. So I'll I'll share. So I I did write about a conflict that I'm having. Uh something I'm struggling with. <clears throat> and I would say that um, writing it and just and reading it over just kind of helped me process the emotions associated with it. <clears throat> so it was kind of a, a similar to like talking with someone about it, uh, which is that uh, I, I got some of my energy out uh, and that just helps me think about it a little bit more clearly because I'm not so I don't have as much charge on it. Uh, and so I think writing helps in that helps me in that way. Thank you. For, for me, I, uh, I was starting to think about, oh, how do we, I was thinking sort of in practical uh, terms, like, oh, how do we take the self empathy and, and map it over to the uh, empathy circle uh, process? So I was kind of in a sort of a work mode and then Sort of like Kara uh, was saying, like just noticing how things arise within me, and sort of a curiosity of of how you know what kind of bubbles up and what has uh, um, energy to it, and sort of that uh, exploration of that. So, are there any suggestions to? Uh, like make alterations to this exercise or do you think this exercise would be a good thing to include for practicing self-empathy or any feedback on that? I I think it, it's great what, what you've done. Just wondering if some small guidance might help. You know, when you say in the PowerPoint, you can pick anything that's happening in your life. Um, it might be useful to give some examples, uh, one or two examples to spark people who may be feeling, oh, I don't know which to pick, you know, like, you, I don't know. Yeah, just some examples from your own life, say, or the facilitator could give examples just to help people focus. Um, yeah, thank you, Wendy. Um, I, I think it would be good to acknowledge that writing, just that there are different modalities of how people might do self-empathy and that what you selected for people to do, which is writing, is one of them. So yeah. I might do writing, I might talk to somebody, I guess, well, I guess if I'm talking to myself, that's kind of an internal form of self-empathy. Um, movement or gesture can also be a form of self-empathy um you know connecting with what is alive in you in me um 
And also, um, there's another modality that I use sometimes, which is like um, not not writing, but actually speaking. Like di if there are different voices, competing voices inside me, actually giving voice to those, mm -hmm. um, and even moving, like setting up chairs and moving to different chairs, is a way of of um, externalizing. Uh, what is going on inside me and this is writing is a way of externalizing it also and it is different than just mentally me thinking it to myself um, and so just recognizing there are different modes of doing that and this is one mode we're trying this time you know one way yeah. To yeah and maybe we can include all these different modes as well uh, in the take-home exercises for people to practice at home I'm, I'm thinking of time, um, and I'm wondering if you're planning on an empathy circle uh, where we could explore yeah. the self empathy. Yeah, so I have some other exercises which you guys can read uh, later. And thank you, Violeta, for reminding me about the time. This is my last slide. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to go into uh, an empathy circle and uh, discuss uh, whatever. Uh, just stop sharing. Yeah, discuss whatever came up for you through this discussion and uh, how you're going to, maybe what you can contribute, your feedback, maybe this sparked something else for your own uh, section that you're working on. So whatever you'd like to discuss. And Edwin, would you like to make the breakout rooms? You wanna do two rooms or stay in one or how? You... Uh, what, would, what would everybody prefer? I think two rooms vote? so that we can discuss more, okay. like two rooms. Um. Okay, so she left. One second here. Um, okay, two rooms and do you, any this thing to uh, talk about? Just what's alive for everyone about this, and and uh, uh, do you have a time limit or anything? So, how much more minutes? time do we have left? Half an hour, we right? Have about uh, thirty minutes. So ten minutes for big group discussion. Twenty minutes. Okay. For the circle. Probably shorter turns. So, so uh, Lou, do you want to facilitate one? And Priyanka, you'll be in, in this one. And can you record, Lou? Are you? OK. OK, so here we go. There'll be four of us in each one. Here we go. OK, yeah, we're, this is us four here. How many minute turns? Three. Three? Yep. Okay. I'll take the time. Would someone like to start? Can you repeat the question for us? Or what? I mean, obviously, whatever's on our mind. Particular whatever is alive in you. Uh, whatever this brought up in terms of what feedback you want to give, how you'd like to contribute, not just to self-empathy, but maybe this also sparked something about how you can contribute to the entire project in your section that you're working on or anything else is whatever is alive in you. I'll start, speak to Kara. Okay. I'm listening. Um, yeah, I like just getting this, the topic out there like you're doing and uh, like uh, Priyanka is doing and uh, so, I think it just gives a lot of jumping off points. You get just get something started, you know, get a draft out there. And uh, so I'm really appreciating it. And I think it's a great topic. Uh, I hear that you have some gratitude for getting the topic out there so that we can start the conversation and use it as a launching spot. And the other part is more of the didactic component. I would imagine making a video 
of it that people can watch uh, before the course. You know, there, there can be some didactic, but you know, uh, more didactic informational uh, piece could be be done uh, separately uh, that people watch beforehand. So we have more time in the meeting uh, for sort of hands-on, like the mind, the, the the body scan. So more, maybe more time for an empathy circle. So I hear you have a suggestion of having a little pre-work, maybe a little didactic uh, videos or interactive things that people can do in advance so that we can do more group things within the call. Yeah. And because, every, and also every assertion about something like, oh, there's hate, you know, we have self-hate or something. I, I appreciate the, yeah, well, you know, we may have so those those qualifications of it is good. Like, you know, it's not everybody's that you may have fear, you may have this, you know, so those qualifications, because and also every assertion, I, I have response to everyone that could be a whole discussion of its own, right? I could speak for a whole circle on every single slide. It could be, you know, I have all kinds of thoughts that, you know, you, you want to kind of share. So generally speaking, all generalizations uh, bring up some assumption. And as soon as that happens, there is a discussion available. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a great, it's a really good, uh, yeah, you know, getting, I really appreciate, you know, what Priyanka has been doing. She's been working hard. So really uh, grateful for all her efforts and to keep iterating, you know, this iterating and a lot of thoughts. So I'm sure will come up, you know, after, it's usually on the spot, so I have some thoughts, but I kind of it mulls over for a week or so, and then thoughts keep sort of popping up during the week. Yeah. So I heard more gratitude for Priyanka getting this out there and getting it started because for you, the process, you have some immediate thoughts, but it's kind of simmer in there for a little while and things are going to bubble up to the surface throughout the week. Yeah. And the other part is really to connect with the self empathy to the empathy circle. So every assertion, how does it fit in to the empathy circle so that we ground it in the experience? Uh, and I think I was just looking into phenomenological uh, phenomenology that you start with the experience and then you sort of extra, you, you create the theory on top of the experience. So it's not theory experience, but experience theory. Uh, so I heard you say phenomenology, which is what a great word. Um, and that this, the way that this self-empathy works and specifically the empathy circle works is that the experience happens and then the terminology comes from said experience. Yeah, fully heard, thank you. Oh, that means it's my turn. All right, I'm gonna talk to DJ. Okay. I, you know, I really love this. Uh, the whole self-empathy thing is a, is a topic I, I spend in a roundabout way, a lot of time working on with my clients um, in the in the sense that you have to manage yourself if you want to manage anybody else. You spend a lot of time on this topic. You really love this topic. And you spend time with your clients on this topic because you really have to have self-empathy before you can manage other people. Yeah. Uh, it, are we, we kind of touched on some of the things that I think are key. And so I'm going to try and say them out loud and get them out of my head. Um, time management, energy management, focus management, and like all of those, you know. And then the BS, the belief systems that we bring into every one of these conversations. We come with our own BS and then we share it. Did you say BS? I did belief systems. <laughs> I said what I said. <laughs> okay, so we all come with our own BS system, and this could have to do with time management. It could have to do with, um, I'm sorry, key management, did you say? Energy, energy, energy. time. Energy, time. What else was there? Energy, okay. time focus and you t and you see all of these tied to the belief system right well so 
belief systems being yet another one thing that we bring in that, that the things that we have to manage when doing self empathy is, you know, whatever pre agreed things we think is how it is. And then you get to look at it and go, Oh, Hmm. So belief systems are just part of what we bring to the table in management and in your experience with your clients. And um, so there's all these preconceived ideas or you come with all these ideas and then you come and you think, hmm, maybe, maybe it's a little different. Yeah, so that's self-empathy. That, that allows you the space, the safe space to really look at those belief systems, to look at your time management, to look at your energy management and not be like, oh, I'm terrible or, oh, I'm amazing. Instead, you just go, oh, huh. well, that's me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So self-empathy is really about resonating with these maybe new ideas or new perspectives or new skills or the importance of different things. And it's not about judging self. It's not about like, I'm great, I'm wonderful, or I'm horrible. Um, but it's, 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 it's an expansion, right? Yeah, I completely heard. Thank you. That was great. Yeah, Priyanka, I just have loved what you've done here. Uh, I think uh, it shows your hard work. Um, I really liked Priyanka's writing exercise. I think there are a lot of people who maybe have never done something like that. So, I'll pause so there. You loved, you loved what I did here and it shows my hard work and you also love the writing exercise and you, you feel that there are many people who've never done this before, something like this before. Yes, and I think that you can take advantage of that and maybe kind of layer this whole experience that you're defining and kind of including. And that maybe before they come to the empathy circle, you know, you've kind of given them the, the knowledge and the awareness of self empathy. There will be people who don't even know what that is, right? And then there'll be people who are like professionals like Kara working with it. Yeah. So there will be people who don't even know what self-empathy is, and there might be people who work with it every day like Kara. And so I can use these uh, before they even come to the self-empathy circle, I can use different layers and uh, tell, tell people what self-empathy is. Well, give them the option of exercising different kinds of self-empathy exercises and give them options to have it layered. You know, so like when you said with the writing exercise, um, listen to yourself and what you're gonna do is write it and then you're gonna go through it and look for judgments. Well, that tells me that I'm not gonna write any judgments because I'm not, you know, I already know that's what I'm supposed to be looking for. So it was contrived in that sense for me because I feel that I'm experienced in self-empathy. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah, because your experience is self-empathy. The exercise was uh, that when you when you tell people, okay, you write what uh, write whatever's in you, and then look for judgments. People will know before that they don't have to write any judgments, so they might not do that. Right, and so it's really just an examination of, of what's the, the deeper purpose of all of this, you know, and sort of just examining and giving people the freedom of expression to kind of make it whatever they, they need it to be at that time and just make it self-discovery. That's what my suggestion would be. Yeah, so just let people uh, express themselves, make it about self-discovery, and so that's your suggestion. Yeah, thank you very much, Priyanka. I feel fully heard. Yeah, uh, Edwin, would you be willing to listen to me? Yep, listening. Yeah, uh, so uh, DJ, just to clarify that I was not supposed to uh, say that about the judgments until after people have written, but I just uh, said that because uh, you wanted to know what the exercise is about. So mm -hmm. that's, 
Um, but yeah, I'm open to like, it was just some idea I had and I wanted to test it out, but yeah, please do give your feedback in, uh, in the form so we can make better exercises. Yeah. You're just clarifying that you weren't going to talk. You weren't going to mention the judgment before you did the exercise, but talk about it after, and you're glad to get any, uh, feedback. Uh, and you only get told, talked about the judgment because the DJ had sort of asked the, had to ask the question and you're glad for feedback. Yeah, uh, I loved all the feedback. I got so many ideas and I, my mind was just full of ideas. And I think uh, with all the feedback, I'm going to work on making it better. And uh, another thing that stuck for me was, yeah, the definition, I knew that it was a lot, but I wanted to include everything that I had researched. So I had researched basically IFS, Gendlin and uh, NBC. And I felt like these were the most relevant to the circle, to the experience in the circle. Yeah, you know, you put a lot into the uh, definition. You you took material from uh, NBC, from Gendlin focusing, and from internal family systems. And you know, it's a lot, but you just kind of were trying to get it all in there. Yeah, and I'm also uh, uh, I, I I like the suggestion about somebody said just keep it very simple, and then the other things you can like do it in other ways so that people are not overwhelmed. I think that's a, that was a great suggestion. Yeah, you, you have a lot of ideas sort of popping, coming in, and one of them is the, you, somebody suggests to just have a simple definition and then work the other parts in uh, differently. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I also like Lou's suggestion of like uh, having this idea that they, they could, that the journaling is just one kind of self mm -hmm. way of practicing self-empathy. There could be many other ways. But also focusing, I think I forgot to do that, was focusing on how self-empathy happens in the circle, because that's what we're doing here. I think I, I didn't, I neglected to do that, or I didn't think about it, so I'm going to add that in later. Yeah, you, you uh, didn't put so much in terms of the, uh, the self-empathy and the empathy circle, and you sort of forgot that, but you're going you're gonna to add that. And also Lou had some suggestions, which I forgot that you're going to, so those are all the ideas that are popping of, of what to uh, sort of include. Yeah, and I also had this idea of like when you mentioned the video that we need to make it into a video of making this like, you know, you see this uh, on YouTube, all these animated videos. They are so mm. beautiful and interesting to watch. I'm wondering if we could do something like that. But they, those things cost a lot of money, those software. So I don't know how that will happen. Yeah, so you're, you have another idea popping is, oh, this could be a... A standalone video, but it could be narrated you know, with the cartoon kind of animated, and and you're just wondering, well, how would that be done? And you know, it, it could be expensive, but just thinking about it. And... Yeah. Thank you, Edwin. Okay, uh, DJ. Okay. Um, yeah. The the aspect of how the uh, empathy circle relates to self empathy, uh, you know, really fleshing that out because that's really what we want to do is if we say you know a term like hate or something can you point to something in the empathy circle where that feeling is uh so you're thinking about an empathy circle and connected to um the self-empathy and you're thinking about how the term hate might be integrated into the empathy circle like where can you see that mm, or it's like I don't see so much hate. It's actually I think the term it was the term was hate, but then it came into uh, fear or anxiety. And there's plenty of fear and anxiety in the empathy circle. So, you know, speaking to that. So it's really about maybe fear and anxiety, not so much hate, because there's plenty of fear and anxiety in the empathy circle. And the the one aspect is is that when it's my turn to speak. You know, it could be that the the body scan could be a starting point. Okay, it's my turn to speak. I'm going to do a body scan now and see what arises in, in, in you know, and then I'm going to speak to that. Uh, so that could be one way of kind of making that body scan uh, a connection. So you have this idea, this brainstorm about using the body scan, the technique that Priyanka um, shared with us. Um, when someone is about to speak in the empathy circle, they can do a body scan and, and find what's alive for them that way. And then 
the uh, gentle and the focusing process, I think that whole process could be called self-empathy because uh, Gendlin was all about in the therapeutic context, context, the speaker who is speaking, how do they sense into their body? So it's a whole tool set for doing that. And it totally overlaps with the empathy circle. So you're thinking of Gendlin's uh, theories that Priyanka talked about earlier and that um, it really fits really well with the body scan because you're looking inside, you're looking within in his theory of focus. Yeah, and it, his whole theory was uh, he studied like people who are doing therapy, some people grow and move forward and some don't. And he tried to understand why they grow and why they don't. And his observation was people who spoke to their felt experience from moment to moment were the ones that sort of created internal motion and they and that's what kind of led to that healing was that that authentic sharing of those inner felt experiences even if they're kind of vague so uh jen then was kind of in this quandary about like why did some people move forward and other people didn't move forward in therapy so he came up with this notion about looking inward and how the people who were more in touch with how they were feeling uh, moment to moment were really uh, sort of sort of moving forward in a sense um, by by being in touch with it and talking about it in the empathy circle. This would really work. Exactly. Yeah, I feel fully heard. <laughs> so, Kara, you're back. Uh, we have three minutes left, so. Okay. Okay, well, I'll just go for one minute then. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say something sort of like general, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Edwin had mentioned <clears throat> about tying self-empathy to relational empathy or other kinds of empathy. And so um, I think that's a really good thing for me to think about because I'm doing relational empathy <laughs> and I really don't see the connections, but what Edwin just said is really helpful for me. So, so Edwin gave you a, uh, what I heard is Edwin helped you see a connection between self-empathy and relational empathy that you had previously not seen and that was really handy. Okay, I'm done. Uh, I missed all of that that happened just a minute ago. So uh, are we just doing one minute recaps? Is that kind of the... Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll just do a discussion. Uh, how was the circle for you? And we have just two minutes left. Am I talking to anyone in particular? Should I be doing that? Or are we just general conversation now? Just a general conversation. No, I really, I thought all of this, like Edwin said at the very beginning, I mean, this you put in a ton of work and it gave us a lot of space to start discussions and to really dive deep into a topic that is delicious and rich. Thank you. I think Kara should be like a marketing person. <laughs> she makes <laughs> everything so exciting. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed preparing for it and I, I got so many ideas. I'm just trying to write them down before I forget. And another, uh, I think two pro projects can branch out of this is one is, I don't know if Edwin is interested, but to develop this self-empathy scale is something I, I've, I'm very interested in. And also developing like, a, like a, we could make like a database of activities that people could do, like Lou mentioned, like there are different kinds of self-empathy. So for people to just take home, but also in the circle things people can do in the circle while they're in the circle. Yeah, you can be the Kristen F of self-empathy, Kristen F of self-compassion. Uh, self <laughs> There's just so much Yeah, you can really kind of build yeah. on here. It's a life time of work too. Or should I close the room? Where I think we're at that close all rooms. I want about 10 minutes debrief for everyone. <laughs> so
So uh, Edwin, where will people be sharing their feedback on the on the project page? Uh, sharing feedback, we have the notes page, if that's what you yeah. mean. The, uh, yeah, the notes page, the, yeah. You know, I've taken some notes. Uh, DJ's taken a lot of notes there. So. And plus the video, you know, I do uh, post this and then I'll run it through the Otter uh, transcription. So we'll have the notes, the the video, hopefully uh, Lou is able to record the video and we'll have recordings of their circle too. So should have tons of notes. Hmm. Okay. How do you want to close this out, Priyanka? I just like to say thank you, everybody, for your feedback. Uh, really appreciate it. I've got so many ideas in my head. I'm just trying to write them down now. Yeah. And um, yeah, I hope that you, from my attempt, that I hope that you got uh, some ideas of also how to uh, develop your part. And I totally take in the concern of uh, Violetta, where we have to be on the same uh, like on the same page when it comes to the terminologies. I totally agree with that. So uh, Violetta, if you'd like to leave your feedback on the note, I'm not a psychologist, so I just, whatever my understanding was, but I know since you're, you're more trained in the field that maybe we could work on the terminology. Uh, and also I'm, I'm going to be working on more activities that we can integrate into the circle where people can practice self-empathy whilst they're in the circle like what Lou mentioned about different kinds of self-empathy. So this is what I'm taking and uh, would love to hear from all of you what you are taking from this session today. Uh, maybe we can start with Wendy. Um, I'm taking away the fact of just rejoicing, really thoroughly rejoicing, Priyanka, in all your hard work and pulling and creating creating what you've created and it's just a great start and and I really feel your openness to evolving it and changing it so just a great appreciation for everybody here and and all of their contributions and Priyanka thank you thank you Wendy Jenna yeah I appreciate um being here together um, to the extent that I could be here and I appreciate that you put a lot of work into self-empathy and a lot of thought and a lot of reflection into it and um, I don't know if I should say what I said in the other room there's a wonderful video and I'll put a link to it that would really help in preparing presentations. Violetta? You definitely helped me think about my presentation, which is not ready, and I'm going to be working on it this week. Um, but I'm glad I procrastinated. I usually don't do that, but it was very helpful to see um, your presentation on self-empathy. And what I said in the breakout room is that I think I will completely chop off a portion of imaginative empathy. And I wonder if this could happen, needs to happen in most sessions. So we, we keep a more focused, more centered, um, model of how, how do we approach uh, the, the conversation. Um, something that Wendy mentioned in a break, breakout room, uh, I think is important. Many things were important, of course, but um, the definition of self um, could be enriched um, since we're doing with self-empathy. Empathy is quite talked about, but self a little less. Uh, maybe, maybe have a deeper uh, treatment of of that concept, and I'm I'm definitely available to chat with you. I don't know anything about self empathy, but I could I could help with clarifying things probably. Although I wonder if somebody that's not a psychologist would be more helpful in that. I'm available. Thank you, Priyanka, for your hard work. Thank you, Lou. Yeah, so I'm I'm uh, appreciating the play of being here and listening to everybody and having fun thinking myself about this this stuff uh, i'm also uh today's session has reminded me of the value of writing 
Um, I, writing is not my first instinct, talking is, but writing is wonderful. So thanks for doing that bit of experiential learning. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I think that the, well, complexity has been talked about a lot. I don't need to say more about complexity. Um, I think that what comments that have been made about ethnocentricity or, or wanting to bring in the wisdom of other points of view, that I think if there are other points of view that are missing, um, that, that uh, bringing in stuff from them is a good idea or examining them. So, yeah, I would say, you know, that's a, that's a good thing to do. And I would say, well, you've done, a, you've done a lot of work, Priyanka, so I don't want to put that on your plate. So I'd say people that are aware of other things that might be of value, please offer them. Um, and there was one more point I wanted to make. Uh, oh, well, I think just appreciating you, feeling a lot of gratitude for you, Priyanka, for what you, the work that you did and for everyone else too, for their contributions. Thank you, Lou. Kara? Just a lot of really good discussion. I think that empathy allows us to have many discussions in general and in an easy kind of way. And I think self-discovery is one of the harder discussions to have, especially with other people, let alone with ourselves. And doing it in an empathetic kind of way in a circle that allows you to intentionally hear yourself and watch for your own triggers, I think this is gonna be transformational and I cannot wait to see you develop those different levels and come up with more activities to do. Thank you, Kara. DJ? Yeah, this was great. Really wonderful. Um, thank you, Lou, for what you just said. Um, thank you, Edwin, for what you said. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I have nothing but love for all of you. What an incredible thing to spend two hours talking about self-empathy. I mean, it's just such a beautiful experience. You know, um, and uh, thank you. Um, I think I want to kind of model relational empathy on what you've just done, um, Priyanka. I really like the way that you did it. Um, and I love your openness and your ability to listen. And you're a beautiful person. I'm so glad to know you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, DJ. Edwin? Uh, yeah, very appreciative of all your work uh, on this and also your enthusiasm is sort of infectious. It's like, hey, you're really enthusiastic. It's just fun to, to, to be around. Uh, so it's, it's enjoyable uh, for me. And also feel, I'm going to do a Lou. He's always talking about, oh, my heart is full. <laughs> I feel that. It's like, this is what a wonderful group just doing this exploration together. You know, everybody's voice can be heard. We have a space to, and it's a, we kind of grow by doing, you know, you just learn by doing and it's an iterative process, you know, or just keep working at it and keeps refining and keeps improving. So yeah, that's it. Yeah. So uh, Edwin has shared the link of the notes page. So I'd really love for you, all of you to, because I'm so afraid I might miss some feedback to put your feedback into the notes page so that when we are redoing it again and uh, we can, uh, I can make sure that I don't miss out on anything. And I'll send out a link too. I'll put everything on on uh, you know the video, post it to YouTube, and create a page with the uh, transcripts with the notes and everything, and send that to everyone. So actually, that would be really the transcript is really useful in terms of um, calling that feedback too. Yeah, and I yeah. and I recorded our breakout, okay. so you'll have that. Yeah, I'll put both videos to the transcripts and people can uh, do live transcript click on the cc do full view full transcript and then click save transcript and it will be saved to your computer now it's not really great but it's something yeah for the transcripts i use otter uh, ai 
it runs through, it does a pretty good job. Uh, it remembers the different voices, so it automatically labels the voices. Like some of our voices are already there, so it'll, every time Lou is spoke, it'll name, it'll recognize Lou and myself and a few others who are who are there. Uh, as well as you can go through and listen to it, uh, you can see the text, and you can go in and clean it up and stuff too. So it's uh, it, the other videos uh, have been run through that. If you want to check that. Okay, so I guess that is it. We're all set. The uh, next week is Violetta, so <laughs> you got your work cut out for you. We're looking forward to uh, seeing uh, imaginative empathy. Yeah, so uh, me too. Me too. <laughs> until then, maybe we'll do our jazz hands uh, goodbye and uh, see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Have a good Bye. day. Yes.